You're watching Beyond Markets. Welcome. I'm Kenneth Ibomo. Coming up on today's show, we'll continue our series on the conversations leading to Nigeria's 2019 elections. We started off this series by setting a bar for the quality of conversations that we need to have to shape the national discourse here in Nigeria. We then shifted our focus to Nigeria's development priorities. On today's show, we'll focus on how Nigeria can build a more competitive economy beyond 2019. Don't forget, you can always join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag Beyond Markets. Follow me at Kenneth Igbomo. Nigeria's global competitiveness ranking dropped three places in the latest Global Competitiveness Index released by the World Economic Forum. So what are the factors holding back Africa's largest economy from taking pole position on the continent and beyond in the area of competitiveness? Chika Modi, the CEO of the National Competitiveness Council of Nigeria, joins me for this discussion. I'd like to start off with getting your thoughts first on you know, the conversations that we really need to have you know, going into 2019. Um, thank you, Ken, um, for having me on. I think it's, it's very critical that we have a substance, substantive conversation around where Nigeria is going. I think whoever finds himself as president in May 2019 is going to face a very, very onerous task. I mean, the data is really sad to see. So you have population growing at 3.5%, 3.2%, and any growth below that means that average income is dropping. Unfortunately, for the last 12 quarters, we've had a drop in average income. Now, popular, this growth is happening at a time when the stock of jobs, unemployment, is way, way high. And just to clear the existing stock of unemployment, we have to have transformative and inclusive growth that can take out people off that market. Unfortunately, more people are going in than are coming out. So whoever comes in has his work cut out for him. So we have to have this conversation around how we can have massive transformative economic growth. All right then, so what, when you look at some of the government's objectives that are on ground already, we're seeing that a key part of the government's economic recovery and growth plan is building a globally competitive economy. You know, so what is holding us back from getting to where we need to be? We know where we are, we're 115th on the, on, on the globally right now, so where do we need to be as Africa's largest economy? Well, there are some fundamental strengths that if you look at the um, index and you see some of the areas where we're doing very well, like market size is something that is sort of inherited. So if you have 190 million people, you already have a huge domestic market. Mm -hmm. That's an advantage. Right? And you have some of the elements of resources that we could translate you know, to that, to make it happen. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we've performed very poorly, and this is not a judgment on anyone, it's historically been the case, and it's not quite changed, that we have performed poorly on the key areas, first of all, around the environment, mm -hmm. like creating an enabling environment for business to prosper. So things like the macroeconomic environment, the, the level of inflation in the last few years is one that is a retardant for any significant business activity. The same thing with the institutions, um, the same um, problem you have in terms of you know, regulations and elements of the business environment that can lead um, to growth. In this case, they retard growth. But in terms of human capital, we have huge challenges. Some of them are not reflected even in the results. So the number of kids outside school is growing. The level of skills is still very low. We need a dramatic change in the kind of skills that um, businesses need so that they can employ mm -hmm. people and they could actually grow. Um, health had a marginal improvement if you look at the index, but it's deceptive because it was a very low base and that change is not quite significant. Again, we need to have significant investments in health infrastructure to improve the quality of our labor. Okay, but at the end of the day, competitiveness is all about the, the productivity of the local industries, you know, mm -hmm. and how best you produce goods and services in your country compared to the rest of the world, you know. When you look at our environment, what are the quick wins you think we can have? Get together real quick so we can get some level of traction get going and then we can focus on the other longer term objectives. So some quick wins and transformative wins, I think is we could just distinguish between both of them. So the quick wins might be something that could help you with a score. But in terms of fundamental improvements on competitiveness which we need, there are transformative wins that must be achieved. The first is power. Right. You can, power cripples any sort of industrial production in Nigeria, and even the service industry suffers from power. So you have to overcome a lot of hurdles just to get power, and it makes it not viable for 
the large majority of businesses that ordinarily will be viable. So fixing power, by this I mean electricity, is a low, it's, it's a transformative win. And if there's the correct kind of commitment and policy sets, this can be fixed. Um, the other area is some elements of transportation. And this is not about future industries, but agriculture, we could exponentially grow agricultural output just by improving the power infrastructure and having corridors that link all of this. So things like perishing agri commodities, getting things to market on time, and getting um, formal systems that can codify and get export ready um, agri outputs as well as local markets. Now, in terms of enabling business, again, there's some wins there. Some of it is already happening with what Pebec is doing. There needs to be a fundamental involvement of the private sector so that there's healthy business um, government policy contestation. The, the engagement of the private sector at all levels, not just the large corporates at the SME level and cross board, um, can be improved upon. If you engage them more, then you can be more specific with policies that improve you know, the environment for them. And this does not come at a great cost. This is more about um, discussions. And finally, I think no competitive, competitiveness program can be successful if you don't have total commitment at the very top. So there has to be commitment at the top. There has to be a vision that is agreed in what kind of Nigeria do you want to be in the over so, -so period. I was actually and getting that, so that, that point of setting a vision, you know, because when you look at countries that have done this and, and did it so well, you look at countries like Georgia, you're looking at, looking at Singapore, you're looking at mm -hmm. Mauritius, they set, so most of these countries set a target between themselves and then they took, it, took, it, took the message from top down and everybody right. ran with that vision. Why is this not happening for Nigeria? Um, there are a variety of reasons. And again, I don't want to pass judgments or make normative comments on, on state of government for obvious reasons. An election is coming up, so there's some political sensitivity. But it's not a coincidence that Kenya has a vision 2030, Ghana has some sort of vision thing. Even China, as much as they're growing, they're not happy with the growth that is now single digit growth. Right? And they have this Made in China 2050 program. And the, when you have such a program, like you rightly said, you align resources towards it, you get buying, not just in government, not just in public sector, but also the private sector. That encourages investments, investors, because they have some certainty about where the policy is heading. And it doesn't matter if it's opposition or the incumbent government in these countries, they all sign on to those things. In Kenya, I remember in the last election, Kenyatta was in debates with... Um, the, um, the gentleman, Raul um, Odinga, about who would be better at implementing the, um, the Kenyan vision 2030. We need that kind of situation here where we have that. And um, sadly, over the years, we've had fora where some sort of formal um, structure is put forward, but it's never quite translated to one that is clear, precise, and has the bind of everyone. Okay, I would like to take things now to the sub-national level. You know, and look at how the the states within Nigeria can compete, can how they can set a bar for states to compete within with, um, amongst themselves, mm -hmm. so that there's that traction between you know when you know see a state next to you is doing very well on this front, and you know you mm -hmm. can also do that. It kind of encourages the governments in those states to do more. Cool. How do you think we can get this going first among the states before we even take it to the national level? Okay, so the way to go about it, I totally I totally subscribe to this this uh, to your um, proposition about states competing. Healthy competition among states, even among nations too, leads to growth. I think if there was no Singapore, Malaysia would not have had the growth it's had. And if Mexico's had this wonderful situation where the states compete as well. So what we did was last year we um, put forward a competitiveness index where we measured, sub-national, where we, me we measured all the states, evaluated them against an indexes, ranked them, engaged with them to put that forward. Um, unfortunately, the follow through, the, you know, the follow through that is required um, at a higher level is needed for the states to do that. And the awareness of, of the public, the public is very much aware on how states rank, then there's political pressure. Because in the end, elected officials care about the next election. And if there is something, if they feel the electorate can perceive, can perceive where they are on those things, then the, the commission kicks in. So I think the starting point is to do more of the subnational indexes, publicize it more, and engage with the governments more in terms of policy sets that can help them improve their rankings. Okay, so still 
on the subnational level still and also on the national because this question kind of cuts across both sides. When you look at the comparative advantage of Nigeria, yes, mm -hmm. everybody knows that we do oil. Everybody mm -hmm. knows we, 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 we can. I want to look, to look beyond oil now, mm -hmm. you know, and look at first where we can see some comparative advantage within the states and then mm -hmm. come together as a nation to deploy this advantage. Mm -hmm. I think the, the fundamentals for Nigeria um, point to increased productivity. And I mean, I, I'm one of those people who I'm not very strong as, on winners and losers, and we've had these conversations before. Because some, one of the models or alternative models for planning of this nature is people say, okay, we're going to be this sort of country, we're going to be a cluster of this, and we're therefore going to you know, get policies towards being good in this sort of business. Um, I feel that um, if you create an enabling environment, the market itself will drive productivity. If you walk between here and the end of Adiola Adeku and you interview people, you're going to get at least 50% of the adults, if they have the option, will start a business. If you ask them, what do you want to do if you have money? Oh, I'll start a business. There are not many countries where you have that sort of entrepreneurial fervor. People might want to save money or invest it, but here, Nigerians want to start a business. So there are a lot of entrepreneurs in this country. Um, there's a market that is large enough for them. So what you want to do is to create that environment that will make it more productive to do business here. And the private sector will take care of the rest. There, we, where we play with examples on how that has happened, the government didn't have to persuade anyone to go into banking. They just had to open it up. And they had to deal with how to even regulate this. Same thing with aviation. Same thing with the telecoms industry and many other industries. So, but if you make the cost of operations low in terms of com compared to comparative to other countries, meaning things like power, the cost of clearing goods or exporting them, the business environment, the cost of borrowing, the, uh, the macroeconomic stability that it requires, the cost of transportation, then you're going to see businesses explode. We are Africa's largest economy. Yes. We're in West Africa. How do we make that influence as Africa's largest eco economy? felt first regionally, you know, so that we can create products and markets first in that to, to on this uh, ECOWAS block, yes. you know, and then take advantage of all the, uh, the advantage that we have there. And then more before we even go into the wider Africa, why are we not doing this? I think it's down to, um, there's, there's some structural problems and then there's political will and they're interrelated. So if you look at inter-African trade, which is substantial, Something like 40% of all intra-African trade is done by Indian companies. So an Indian company in Cote d'Ivoire sells to an Indian company, say in Nigeria, or an Indian company in Kenya sells to an Indian company in Uganda. Right? So even with all the constraints you have, structural constraints, um, there is that sort of activity going on. Now, if you have the political will, because ECOWAS is basically, with all respect, ECOWAS is Nigeria. Nigeria is by far the largest, not just the largest economy, but it's the preponderant economy in the, we in the region. So it depends on what year you look at. We are between 70 and 80% of the economy of, of the economic output of West Africa and half of West Africa population-wise, right? So we are overrepresented in terms of the economy, right? However, we're not able to take advantage of this even when the opportunity has arisen. When ECOMOC sent troops to um, support the peace in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, with loss of life, by the way. Um, Nigeria did not lift there with one single business deal. But once the peace came back, there were countries that went in there to do deals who were somewhat tangentially involved because we didn't have that uh, vision or even the political will to drive that. Now, the structural problems are around exchange rate and things around settlement because you have different currencies. Um, in terms of if you traveling and movement of goods and services, tariffs, barriers, despite ECOWAS, right, we've not had, and a lot of effort has gone into this, we've not been able to have free trade across the country, but with the, across the, um, the subcontinent. But with the political will, Nigeria can actually drive that and open up those markets, and Nigeria can now become a part of COBO. But guess what is going on right now, Ken? What's going on now is that people look at West Africa, and Nigeria is the country they're interested in, but they go and locate in other countries, Ghana being one of the big beneficiaries and sometimes now Cote d'Ivoire since the war to serve the Nigerian government, okay. serve the Nigerian um, sorry, economy. So, that's, that's sad. So when you look at um, something like the, uh, the Continental Free Trade Agreement coming mm -hmm. on board, mm -hmm. do you think this should have been the very first quick win for Nigeria to say, you know mm -hmm. what, let's stamp our foot on Africa and mm -hmm. say, 
we're going to sit on this and lead on this one. I'm pretty much skeptical, if you, and I don't want to sound cynical, about a lot of these agreements. I think in my lifetime and in my professional career, I've seen literally dozens of trade agreements on the continent. You probably can't point to more than one or two that are actually successful. And the one or two you point at, you probably see some colonial legacy that, that drove it. Because the government should be driving that. The one interest you should drive in those sort of areas is the business interests of companies located here and of Nigerian nationals. All right, and we'll keep our eyes on that, uh, all that thought. Uh, I've been speaking to uh, Chika Modi, the CEO of the NCCN. We'll continue our conversation right after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Beyond Markets. Still with me to discuss how Nigeria can build a more competitive economy beyond 2019 is Chika Modi, the CEO of NCCN. Chika, I'd like to now get your thoughts about first look at the global environment. We've seen how things are playing out. On one hand, we're seeing increased protectionism from different countries around the world. We're seeing the trade wars between the US and China. Mm -hmm. And then don't not to forget that Brexit is actually staring at us in another corner over there. Mm -hmm. When you look at all this and this global development, you know, and you look at Nigeria trying to situate itself in this to be a global economy, you mm -hmm. know, how should we approach this going forward? I feel this is an opportunity. I mean, we can, the, thread of, the thread that comes from all of us is that there could be some depressed economic growth globally. And I think there are signs that that might happen. Um, but I see a big opportunity um, for Nigeria. Um, for one thing, China has been the manufacturer of the world. So they've enjoyed a low cost, they've been a, you know, credible low cost manufacturing base for the rest of the world. Now, when you have Sino-American tensions, as you have right now, uh, it makes sense to look at alternative manufacturing um, bases. We've seen a bit of that in Southeast Asia, where you're seeing growth in some of the countries. But why not Nigeria? We have the geograph geographic advantage of being, you know, equidistant between both hemispheres, right? And so shipping costs are fairly um, average. So I think we can take advantage of that. It's not a coincidence that Theresa May came in here, the Prime Minister, and then um, Macron of, of the UK because Brexit is putting them under pressure to get trade partners as well. So I think Nigeria can play this to her advantage by becoming a ready market and manufacturing base in the midst of all of this. All right then, but when you look at, uh, very interesting you mentioned, you mentioned that because we've seen a lot of presidents coming to Nigeria mm -hmm. just in this very short period of time. We saw Angela Merkel coming, we saw mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Emmanuel Macron also coming come in here. When you look at who Nigeria should be doing business with and who we should be partnering with, should we mm -hmm. be leaning more towards China or more towards the US or mm -hmm. should we be looking more to Europe? Well, right now, the biggest trading partner, not just for Nigeria, for if you look at Africa as a whole, you're probably going to see the EU, you're going to see China, you're going to see um, the US um, in that order of um, priority. And China has been the fastest um, growing trade partner for the continent and for Nigeria as well. I think um, with business with China is like, you know, when you're down with the devil, and with all respect to my Chinese friends, you need a long spoon. And some of the um, debt they've been giving out well, has, become, has come with some very, you know, very, um, some effects that are far less from salubrious. You know, you have to consider the totality of all of that. So there are cheap terms for getting aid or for getting loans. Um, there are lower costs for projects, but it comes with um, negative consequences for the domestic market, labor, um, the quality of what's going on, and how that debt is serviced. There's a new debt trap that is now they're falling into, and you're seeing some creeping colonials and because they're securing this debt with physical assets that now belong to the um, lending country. So I think um, Nigeria should basically play a neutral game where you're not quite aligning with anyone in particular, but you're looking to do business with everyone. But basically market ourselves as an alternative manufacturing or business um, um, destination for those who want to produce for the domestic, their own domestic markets in the US or in the EU. And that's why the EU-Africa trade agreement was an opportunity. The West Africa trade agreement was an opportunity that I think um, we lost. It might not be too late to retrieve that and, and work on that as well. All right, then I'd like to now move on to something I also find quite interesting. It's the fourth industrial revolution. You okay. know how countries can uh, uh, are positioned to use that to leapfrog in different, different, different sectors. How mm -hmm. should Nigeria be to be addressing this? We should be very concerned because one of the tragedies of, of the decline in the economy in the past few years 
is we're, we're focused, maybe hyper-focused, on how do we reduce poverty? How do we stop the slide and get back to economic growth? What the context is changing around us? So if you look at the fourth industrial revolution, the elements of what's happening, look at technology is driving that in many ways, like the ICT revolution. So you're seeing things like algorithm-based stuff, platforms, big data. Um, you're seeing um, autonomous um, um, transport, like you know vehicles that are drones and cars, self-driving cars and things of that nature. You're seeing additive manufacturing, that's like 3D printing. So this is, I think, are the anchors or the foods on which you see, and then biotech um, changes. Um, these changes are happening very quickly, very radically, and there's a lot of uncertainty around uh, where it's going. Um, that's not very good for us because the world is moving very quickly. I think human beings are going to get more and more obsolete, and I'm not saying these are some you know, fancy thing. The fact is, people are getting less and less relevant because it can be replaced with technology, not just automation, but everything from the jobs that you would have thought would be secure. So there's some reports, if you read the Ford Industrial Revolution, you see a list of some 700 jobs that they think will be, you know, obsolete, including things like accounting and, and things of that nature. But how that are we positioning our human capital? This, this? Here, herein lies the challenge. Because one of the things we must do is become a knowledge economy, side by side with all of what we're doing. We must have create an environment where the skills that are relevant, not just to us, but the world of the future, that our people are able to learn those skills, acquire those skills. Um, some of those skills are pretty obvious, right? It's the ability to learn about ICT-related skills, about digital jobs. We have to set um, the environment and policy sets that make sense um, to encourage that sort of thing happening. A lot of this is not about the government just being the only driver in this. A lot of it is about government taking the lead so that they can leverage the resources of the private sector. So like the infrastructure, when we talk about it, we say, okay, we need to have broadband that, of course, how can we get Nigerian kids to have broadband across the country? The government can't probably finance that, even the road, the transport, but they could leverage on private capital and have policy sets that encourage that capital to come in. They could have partnerships and alliances where the $1 billion we're putting in roads here, why can't we convert that to $10 billion of private capital added to our $1 billion? And then we could have arrangements how they pay themselves back and how they finance that. I also think building economies around specialization can actually help us move the needle much faster. What's mm -hmm. your take on this one? Um, yes and no. I think the, in terms of optimality, it's, it's effective to do that. It helps to focus and say, this is what we want to do. But in terms of optim optimality, um, ultimately, it has to be the market that decides. So you could have a suboptimal, somewhat subsidized um, area that you, you're doing, and it's working, and it's creating jobs. But if I can create um, 20 million jobs by having an open market and having sensible reform and creating a stable macro, macroeconomic environment, um, that would be better than if I create two or three million jobs by specializing one particular area and moving resources into it. So this is why I have an alternative view. I think it's not so much either or, or picking one of six, one of all six. Let the market determine the ones that will succeed and the ones that will fail, and then we help drive drive that process. All right, as we round up, I'd like you to speak to the importance now. We know it's an election year, we're going to an election. Down the line, there might be a transition, you know, mm -hmm. whatever happens. I'd like you to speak to the importance of having stable government, mm -hmm. regardless of <coughs> how things turn out, you know, and how that would impact us going forward. It's, it's obvious. I mean, you know, it's, it's obvious. It's without re repetition. If you look at every um, election we've had after 1999, when we return to democracy, and you go to some of the English media houses, it's almost, if you move the year and the names, it's almost the same sort of pattern. The um, predictions of how Nigeria is going to implode, how there's going to be a lot of this and that. And in the build up to every election, we see foreign investment leave. This year, the stock market has already contracted 14.6% year to date. Think about that, the amount of damage that is done. And you're going to see more of this continue all the way up to the election because people pull out for fear of you know, the uncertainty around it. So it's important that the government, the opposition, just Nigeria as a whole, um, portray a unified, common you know, um, image of stability, that regardless of who goes in, there will be a transition. If, if the incumbent stays, it will continue smoothly, so that it's clear to 
investors and domestic and foreign that this is not going to be a problem, there's not going to be some implosion or some massive disruption. All right, then. Thank you so much for your time. Very interesting conversation we've had so far. I've been speaking to Chika Modi, the CEO of NCCN. And that's all we have for this episode of Beyond Market. Thank you so much for joining us. Always, As always, you can always watch previous episodes of Beyond Market on our website at cnbcafrica.com. Stay engaged with the hashtag Beyond Market and follow me at Kenneth Ibomo. Do have a wonderful evening.